Hey everyone, good afternoon and thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I graduated uh, in 2016 with my mechanical and aerospace engineering degree. I'm currently a graduate student here, but I live in Chicago, uh, so it's always good to get back to campus and share a little bit of my experience. I was a student athlete here and I was a student entrepreneur, but I was a pretty lousy student, so I'm pretty happy that they still invited me back to talk here, and I can definitely confirm that GPA was not one of the requirements for being a speaker here. Uh, but this, I'm glad you guys laughed, that wasn't really bad. <laughs> but, but you know, this whole journey started about seven years ago when I came home from practice and asked my dad, hey dad, you know, kind of asking for a friend, do we have good home insurance? He was sort of like, you know, what did you blow up this time? But uh, it's because I was working on my high school science fair project and I wanted to make sort of a model of a jet engine combustion chamber and see if we can improve combustion using plasma. It turns out you can, uh, but sometimes that would happen, so it's good that I asked. Um, I ended up taking this project to the International Science Fair, which I always compare to the Olympics of Science, as nerdy as that sounds. Um, and when I was flying back, one of my teachers uh, pointed out the window and said, can you imagine if in 10 or in 15 years, every aircraft flying is more efficient because of something that you invented? And then, well, it'd be pretty cool. Um, so when I came here to CASE, I started thinking of ways to continue to develop this technology. And originally, I was looking at it at, as just a pure research project, right? You know, sitting in the lab, getting grants with a professor, and then maybe writing some papers. But I was really quickly persuaded by some of my mentors that the best way to pursue this was going to be more like uh, a startup, right? A commercialization play. Something that would let me keep, you know, one eye on developing the technology and then one eye on making sure I was doing something practical that people would care about and hopefully buy. Um, so I got some funds from our innovation center here called Thinkbox, built a prototype with lots of hot glue and started looking at ways of how plasma and flames interacted in you know, actual practical settings, right? What can we actually do with this technology? And it turns out that one of the most critical uh, applications of combustion are jet engines. So as you can imagine, it takes a lot of energy to you know, push us through the air at 35,000 feet and 500 miles an hour. Uh, because it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of fuel, and lots of fuel costs lots of money. So that's like $15 billion in, uh, $30 billion in, in 2015, right? So, Airlines care a lot about reducing their fuel expenditure, even a little bit. So anything you can do to improve uh, their fuel efficiency and improve their bottom line you know, could be a really commercially attractive idea. So that's, that was sort of the, the starting point. But it turns out that jet engines are really good at burning fuel really efficiently anyway. Um, you know, they're designed really to do three main things. Number one, to never, ever, ever shut off for any reason, right? Because if they do and you're flying over the ocean, everyone's going swimming. And that's bad. People don't pay for that. Uh, Number two, to you know, generate the thrust that you need to take off, fly around, et cetera. And number three is to be at their maximum efficiency at your design point, which is cruise, right? When you're flying around and the captain says, you know, uh, you know the fasten seatbelt sign is off, you know, that's where you spend most of your time flying. And that's what engines are really designed for. But we've all been flying and we've you know, all been stuck when we're lot number 26 for departure and you might be waiting 45 or 30 minutes or even an hour on the runway. And that's just like being at a stoplight, right? Your engines are still running, still burning fuel, but you're not going anywhere. Uh, and it turns out that it's not really easy to shut off those engines and then start them back up, sort of like the new cars do. So you know, there, there's really an issue here where you're burning fuel and you're not getting anything good out of it. And if you can solve that, you know, that might be something that's important to the airlines. Um, and it turns out that you, know, you can sort of compare a jet engine to a gas stove. Actually, probably a, a gas stove with a hair dryer. So don't try this at home, because take my word for it, I did it. I actually did it with my sister's hair dryer. Um, you know, essentially, jet engines, they suck in a bunch of air, they compress it, they mix it with fuel where it burns, right, and they shoot it out the back. And it's really difficult to keep a flame lit in this environment. So that's where the, the stove comes in. Let's say you, know, you light your stove and you turn it to full power. If you point a hair dryer at it, you know, there's a good chance that when you're at full power, you're probably not going to be able to blow out that flame. But if you turn down your stove, right, let's say to the lowest setting, uh, it's definitely going to blow out. So that's the same thing that happens in engines, right? It's really difficult to keep flames lit, especially when you're at low power settings like on the ground. Um, and because of this, you know, jet engine manufacturers have only really one knob to play with uh, to control how these engines run, right? Essentially, you can only do tricky things with the aerodynamics to make sure you always have a place where the flame can stay lit. Uh, because you only have one knob to turn, you know, if you turn it one way, right, to maximize safety to make sure this thing never shuts off, then you're going to sacrifice optimum performance, right? You're going to give up some of your fuel consumption at idle, right? Which makes you waste uh, fuel when you're sitting on the ground at, at an airport. Um, but if you cheat and add another knob, right, uh, you can design better engines, right? Because if you have another way to keep the flame lit, 
then you can make sure the engine is safe and efficient at you know, all points in the flight. And it turns out that we can get this you know, other knob from using plasma. So if you've ever seen you know, a lightning storm, you've seen plasma. We don't get those too much in Ohio, but in Florida, where I was from, we definitely do. So plasma is the, the fourth state of matter. You think you have solid, liquid, gas. And if you keep adding energy to that gas, you start taking off electrons off of uh, those atoms, right? And then you have essentially a soup of charged particles, which has a lot of energy and is really good at bumping into things and breaking them. Um, that's important for us in combustion, because in combustion, you have these really large organic fuel molecules that need to break up into smaller pieces before they burn, right? So to give you a simpler example, it's sort of like playing with Legos. Uh, if someone gives you a you know, Lego house and asks you to build a car from those pieces, what's the first thing you have to do? You have to take apart those pieces you know, block by block until you end up with you know, all the blocks disassembled, and then you can build something new. But that's going to take you time, and it's going to take you energy. So if you were to hit that block with a marble, Right, uh, then you end up with all of your blocks individually, and then you can grab them and build whatever you want. That's basically what we're doing with plasma. We're using, you know, instead of marbles, we're using high-speed electrons to bump into large fuel and air molecules, and those break them up into smaller pieces, which burn quicker and more efficiently. Cool, you know, that's, that's sort of been known by science uh, for a while that plasmas can do that. And you can generate plasmas in the lab pretty easily if you have a high-voltage power supply. It's basically just an electrical discharge across air. But the challenge is really how we get something like this or that into you know, something that looks like this, right? An incredibly complex machine that's designed really well and doesn't have much tolerance for change. Um, what I settled on with my team was figuring out ways to integrate this technology into a part that's already on the engine, right? So what we settled on was a fuel injector. That's a part that injects fuel, right? It sits in the engine. It's sort of like a shower head that sprays fuel into the combustion chamber. And uh, we essentially worked on figuring out a way to put a plasma into this part, right, a part that already exists in the engine, a part that you could potentially retrofit easily, and, uh, and then you, you, know, you have your plasma exactly where you need. Now, that had somewhat been tried before, but there had been some practical problems in where you put the plasma, uh, how you integrate you know, this with a current fuel injector design, how you make sure this thing doesn't you know, last 30 minutes when you need to have thousands of hours of flight time. Uh, you know, we, we think we've cracked most of these problems. We did a lot of tests here at CASE and as well as NASA Glenn Research Center. Uh, we have a patent on this technology and we're still working on it, but we think we're, we're pretty close. Um, the challenge here was really taking this fundamental science, right, and putting it at the service of a technology. So that's sort of what your job is as an engineer, right? Take scientific knowledge and use it to solve a practical problem. And then the next step was to take, you know, that solution and put it at the service of a product, right, to actually get it into something that can go into the real world and hopefully make something better for someone. Uh, that part of the journey was, was really what I always thought of as entrepreneurship. But more and more I realized that you know, engineering and entrepreneurship sort of blend because it's not enough to develop a solution. You also have to do the work of carrying it across the finish line. And that means that entrepreneurship has to be involved at the beginning so you know, that, so you know what the solution has to look like at the end. And engineering has to also be involved at the end so you know what you can actually put in an engine. Um, so I'll show you a little bit of, of what this actually looks like. And I think this is going to autoplay. Basically, you know, we, we start a flame just like you would in an engine. And as soon as you, you know, we, we turn off the plasma and we start decreasing the amount of fuel right, going in. So this is sort of what you would have when you're at low power waiting in an airport. You see the flame starts to get really unhappy. It bounces around, right? And eventually it extinguishes. So everyone's going swimming. Uh, we're able to turn it on with plasma, and then we can actually keep that same flame, right, or that same flame with even less fuel lit. And what we can actually do is we can extend the, the limits of operation of a flame by about 60%. So that means we can run a flame with about 60% less fuel than is currently possible. Uh, in real life, this could translate to saving between 1% and 5% on fuel consumption for an actual airline. Um, you know, so there's still a lot of work to do. I traded my garage for a lab at Argonne National Laboratory through a Department of Energy funded program, and this is sort of my, my day job. Um, but it's been really unfamiliar territory, right? Fundamentally, I'm an engineer, not really an entrepreneur. So I've had to learn all of that. And I've always wanted to compare uh, you know, this unfamiliar entrepreneurship thing to something that was much more familiar to me, right? And that's swimming. That was at least 20 hours of my week for the past over 10 years. And actually, a reporter asked me once, you know, how do you, how do you think swimming uh, gets you ready for you know, all your public speaking you do as an entrepreneur and standing in front of big crowds? And I was like, well, yeah, you know, in swimming, I stand in front of many more people wearing nothing but a Speedo. So when I get to do it in a business suit, you know, it's, it's much easier. 
Um, this was one of those quotes that really doesn't play well in a serious article at all. Uh, so then I, I learned that anything you say on the record you know, can actually go in an article. Uh, so lesson, lesson definitely learned. But <laughs> I'll leave you guys with, with you know, four concrete points of what I have taken from my life as a student athlete to my life as a student entrepreneur. And hopefully I'll graduate and be just an entrepreneur. Uh, number one is always be the most prepared. Right? Anyone can tell you to be prepared. But you really have to be the most prepared. Right? In swimming, when you step up on the blocks at a meet, you have to know that you did more uh, than anyone else in your heat, right? than any of your competitors to get ready. And that's the same in entrepreneurship when you walk into a meeting. You have to know more about your technology, your market, your financials, and your product than anyone else in that meeting. If not, it's just not going to work out well. right? There's, there's no faking that. Uh, you get in front of enough smart people, they're going to know when, when you're making things up. Uh, number two, surround yourself with a great team. See some in the back here. Uh, obviously, I was really fortunate to have a great team here. And I've also built a great team at FGC Plasma. Um, actually, three of these are student athletes. And I've been fortunate to work with other great teams at uh, other institutions that we've, uh, we've done some testing with. You know, fundamentally, the idea is to complement skills that you don't have and surround yourself with people that are going to push you. Uh, number three is be passionate. Right? Uh, entrepreneurship, like being a student athlete, uh, is really, really hard. So if you don't have this internal drive uh, that's pushing you towards achieving your goals, you're never going to do it when things are, are getting tough, right? Uh, you know, when you're sore and you can't get out of bed, or when you know, things start breaking in the lab in front of really important people that needed to see this work. If you don't believe in what you're trying to do and you're not very passionate about it, you're not going to be able to get through all of the obstacles. And the fourth and the most important one uh, it doesn't make much sense now, but I'll, I'll get to it. It's get after it, right? This is something our coach would always say to us here. And you know, once, once, so you, you have passion, right? But then you have to apply that passion into doing something. And getting after it in this context really means using sort of everything you have to go after uh, your goal. And you can do that because you're passionate about it. But getting after it is the actual you know, activity, the actual verb of doing that, right? So in the pool, it means giving everything you have. And in entrepreneurship, it means putting in Lots of sleepless nights, uh, you know, giving up social events, trying to work as hard as possible to turn your technological vision into a reality. Now, you know, I, I absolutely love being an entrepreneur. Um, but I think the thing to take away from this talk is that you know, there are things that are applicable to every you know, possible career path that you can have here. As, as engineers, we learn about you know, different conservation laws, right? Conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation of species. Uh, but I think in, in this context, there's, there's another one, and it's conservation of hard work. Right? So if you put in hard work anywhere, and you focus on being uh, better than your competitors, right? doing things better and, and uh, harder than anyone else, you know, eventually those results will come. They might not be when you expect. Uh, they might not be you know, when you want. But eventually, they'll come. So I think you know, even though being an entrepreneur is great, you can take that lesson uh, to anywhere in your life, because you know, not everyone should be an entrepreneur, just like not everyone on a team should be a sprinter, as much as I would have loved to be a sprinter as a distance swimmer. You know, that's not how you win meets. Uh, you know, not everyone can be an entrepreneur. Not everyone can be a doctor. Not everyone can be a lawyer, because we would have terms and conditions on everything. Uh, you know, I think everyone has, has their, their role to play in this world, where your, you know, your passions and your talent align with some sort of you know, common good. Uh, but the thing to take away from entrepreneurship is how you push forward new innovative ideas in complex organizations. So in entrepreneurship, that means selling people on funding you, on partnering with you, on buying your technology. Uh, but it can also mean you know, selling your boss on starting a new project. It can mean selling your PI on a new angle for research. It can even mean selling your uh, professor on giving you an extension on, on an assignment. Right? Fundamentally, all those things are, are types of entrepreneurship. Um, as President Obama told me once, you know, entrepreneurship is all about having an idea work and working to make it a reality. And that's also the essence of the American dream. But I think that's also the essence of what we do as athletes. right? We have an idea, so a goal, and we work every day in practice to make it a reality. Um, and you know, this is not just about being a salesman. Um, right? It's, it's about generating value and communicating it effectively. So although you know, while I, what I talked about, all this plasma stuff, airplanes, jet fuel, that sounds really cool. Uh, you know, fundamentally, we make a really small part of a really complex system. Uh, is it going to do important things for aviation? Hopefully. Uh, is it going to be a game changer in how we think about combustion in other industries? Maybe. Do I get really fired up about it? Definitely. Uh, 
some people are groaning because they've heard me make that joke at least once a week. But you know, the ideas are, are only part of the work, right? The, the real you know, essence of the problem is actually you know, doing the work. Anyone can have a good idea. All of you can absolutely have a good idea and you know, tackle these sort of big problems in our world. Uh, but remember to follow that with, with hard work, right? I think there's a lot of romanticized ideas about entrepreneurship. Um, but you know, those can definitely be motivational. Um, but that's maybe not the best motivation, right? I think we should definitely look for, for those areas in which we can do meaningful work, right? You know, I hope our generation as millennials, we're not just known for making apps and uh, creating companies that turn into unicorns. You know, there's, there's big problems that we can tackle together. Think clean energy, national security, sustainable development, curing diseases. Right? That's, that's all something that, uh, that we can do if we choose to, to you know, work hard and solve problems that are meaningful, even if they're difficult. So I guess my, my challenge to you guys is to you know, find the big problems, work to solve them, and get after it. So I'll leave you with that.